Hello, my name is Matthew Azule. I'm one of the trustees with the Arcbound Foundation. I would now like to platform this excellent collection, Enduring Words, a collection of creative work by prisoners, recently published by Arcbound. There's a link below this video where you can go to purchase this book. So I will now read an extract. This is Prison Priorities by Piaras Heatley. In the beginning, I saw the wasted potential around me. In the beginning, I saw the wasted potential around me. In the beginning, I saw how people are misjudged. I used to be on the outside looking in and never saw myself as part of this ugly machine churning out personality disorders and complexes. Now I am the wasted potential. Now I am the waste in the wind. The wild wood, tree, falls slowly, but not without grace. I have arrived at this destination, and the hole in the ground that I have shattered shows my resolute silence. And only when I have achieved what I set out for, only then will I rest. Now I am part of this machine. Now I am the wasted potential. Now I am the excuse from a broken system. I will be the spanner in the works and I will use these tools to mend the broken home in which we all live. So the next one is a poem titled Sunday by G. Arm. I really like this poem. It's probably my favorite poem from this collection. Dawn broken tests and squawked tannoy noise rests from their slumber, the scrubber dub boys. No bare torsos, no sliders on the landing. Sir, boss or miss to the officers standing. Dictate demands that association commences. A 50 minute hour amidst drone proofed fences. Timidly we emerge through punishing warm, trading muesli and milk in a bravado swarm. Secrets stretched, lasting into days. They crack, skid and sweat due to laundry delays. Confidentially queuing for monitored meds, stories debunked beyond unforgiving beds. Roll call stores for ever absent sheets, uncared, unheard, overcompensating beats, deciphering the world via too oft copied apps, laughing out responses on anti clockwise laps, eyes rising, spying, cell made window blinds, hiding the faces of fellow frightened minds, promenade punctured by peals of last showers, provoking Pavlovian parades back to sea wing towers, veer by vape beggars to the block saloon doors, rooting, tooting banter on hair strewn floors, dodge door lock, pad return, sock soon to cease, two men, single cell, stainless steel, centerpiece, febrile pharaohs entombed throughout the day, as orderlies get fat, we await the sorting hat, TV on continuous play. The last piece I would like to read is called Untitled by Jen McPherson. It was late August, the heady summer days stretched out before me longer than the sun's rays. The days, weeks and months before I arrived had been a whirlwind of chaotic madness which had culminated in my arrest. I looked out the tiny window of the police van that brought me here and wondered what this place would be like. I was terrified. This was prison. I took a deep breath and stepped out of the van onto the jet black tarmac. In every direction there was a high fence reminding me that I was now like a wild animal trapped within a cage. The first few days were a blur. My behaviour was erratic. I was taken to the mental health wing because I was still psychotic and unwell. It is hard to describe how claustrophobic a prison cell is. It is just you, your thoughts and those grimy four walls. It allows you to do a lot of thinking, which is not helpful when you are suffering from psychosis. I couldn't turn on the television in my cell because I thought the news readers were speaking to me. I was conscious that I was being filmed inside and outside for my cell. I couldn't eat the food because I was convinced someone was poisoning me. My mood was low. All I could think about was my elderly father. What kind of daughter was I? I felt suicidal. I soon got hold of a razor and carved deep cuts in my arms. Seeing the blood ooze was a release of my psychic pain. I made friends with another prisoner called Ellie. She was covered in bruises. 
She was frail and reminded me of a sparrow. She kept saying to me, why am I here? We sat in the garden which one of the prison officers had planted and drank cups of tea in the late summer sun. Our moment of peace was soon interrupted by a prison officer bellowing, lock up. We said goodbye and rushed to our prison cells. I soon realised that the way to get out of your cell and away from your thoughts was to get a job. I applied for a job in the prison library. This would prove to be my salvation. The library was an escape from prison life. It was as though you were out in the real world again. Prisoners would come in for the latest crime series, biography or romantic fiction. The most popular books, however, were the prison diaries. It was a privilege being able to hand out books to these prisoners. Each book I read while locked up in my prison cell healed me by some small measure. I was soothed about my mother's death by reading Wild by Cheryl Strayed. I was prepared for my life in a psychiatric ward by reading The Shock of the Fall by Nathan Filer. I was reminded of my university days by reading The Secret History by Donna Tart. McEwen, Tremaine, Ishiguru, they all came to my rescue in my time of need. However, it was one book that saved my life, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. I read it and reread it, underlining passages in a frenzy. My favourite line was, He who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. My why was my father. I knew I had to continue to live for his sake. My delusions were getting worse. I thought there was a parasite in my brain slowly killing me. Please help me, I will soon be dead, I would plead to the prison officers. Thankfully, I soon saw a psychiatrist in the prison. She put me on antipsychotic medication, which partially helped ease my delusions. I told her about my revelation in man's search for meaning. She noted that I had lost weight because I wasn't eating. I soon got used to the rhythm of prison life. Every time my father visited me, I would cry afterward. When I was in my prison cell, I would listen to classical music concerts on Radio 3 and weep at how beautiful the music was, juxtaposed with my grim surroundings. I felt completely worthless. It didn't matter how many times I showered in prison, I still felt dirty. Prison exacerbated my mental illness, which was later to be diagnosed as bipolar disorder. Being locked in a prison cell for most of the day was not conducive to recovery from such a serious illness. It managed the illness rather than treating it. The kindness of one prison officer stopped me self-harming. When he was on shift, my mood would lift. He would talk for hours with me, encouraging me to think about my future outside of prison. His compassion was a balm to my wounds. I will never forget him. The other prisoners on the mental health wing soon became my family. Their stories were heartbreaking. There was Sonia, who had killed her baby, then tried to kill herself, but survived. There were Clara and Emily, who hanged themselves on the main wing of the prison, but were luckily caught in time. There was Paula, who liked being in prison because she had no friends or family on the outside, so kept re-offending. Desperation. Amplified. When I finally went to court six months after being on remand in prison, I was sentenced to a hospital order in a low secure unit. I told Ellie I would write to her. We hugged. I gave her some lavender scented body cream as a parting gift. Would I ever see her again? Probably not. What is true though is that all these women would hold a special place in my heart forever. What did I learn from my time in prison? Prison taught me to endure darkness. It taught me to survive my illness. But most of all, it taught me to cherish the light. The light remains.